So I'm going to pray for you using the Lord's Prayer. And as you pray for other people, you can do the same thing uh, as I do for you. So, so let's pray. Our Father who is in heaven, good morning, Father. Good morning, Jesus. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Hallowed be your name. Oh, in our worship today, in our singing, in our giving, in our lives this week, with our voices, may we treat your name as holy. Your kingdom come, King Jesus. We want to follow you. Help us to follow you. Help us to spread the good news of the kingdom throughout the earth. King Jesus, we look forward to that day when you come back and your kingdom is here in all of its fullness. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Holy Spirit, fall fresh on us. Help us to do God's will on earth as it is in heaven. And may others see us doing your will and join us. Give us this day our daily bread. You know our financial needs as a church and as individuals meet our needs. Oh, and all of our physical needs meet our needs. We are a needy people. And forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Lord, we pause and confess our sins to you. And Lord, as you forgive us so much, help us now. Help us now to forgive those that have wronged us. And Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, deliver us from our flesh of thinking we're wiser than you. Deliver us. Deliver us from the world that puts so much pressure on us to conform. Deliver us from the evil one. Help us to see his lies and deceits and to, and to overcome him. Lord, as we open your word together today, please teach us. And oh, how we pray for revival. Will you not yourself revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? May it start today and spread throughout our community for you are our only hope and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Have, have you ever noticed like when people are driving, let's say down the interstate and they see a car parked on the side of the road or on the side, they often steer right into it. Have you ever noticed that? You know why? Because we steer toward where we stare. That if we stare at something, we tend to drive in that direction. And it's not just true of driving, it's true of all of life, isn't it? I mean, you're watching a basketball game. When someone's shooting a basket, what do they do? They look at what? They look at the basket. They look at where they want the ball to go. And you ever, you ever watch someone sh um, shoot free throws? Like behind the goal, there's all these people trying to distract them, right? And, but boy, they're concentrating on the basket because that's where they want the ball to go. You see someone and they're doing archery. What, what are they looking at? They're not looking at the bow. They're looking what at the bolt. They were looking at where they want the arrow to go. And what we're going to learn about today is just like that with Jesus. That if we want to follow Jesus, it's really important that what? That we look at him and, and we gaze at him and fix our attention. There's so many distractions in the world. But if we want to follow Jesus, it's important we learn to look at Jesus. And uh, so what we're going to learn today is to gaze at Jesus and glance at our circumstances. Uh, would you say that with me? To gaze at Jesus and glance at our circumstances. Do you want to follow Jesus? Then learn to gaze at him. Listen, do you want to grow? Gaze at Jesus. Do, do you want to be freed from sin in your life? Then gaze at Jesus. Do you want to experience peace in a world that often seems crazy? Well, gaze at Jesus. Gaze at Jesus. Do you, do you want to have a boldness in sharing your faith? Do you want to be able to make disciples? Then gaze at Jesus and glance at our circumstances, okay? I mean, can we be honest? Uh, most of us, what? We're always glancing at our circumstances, right? And that's why we're so filled with fear and worry and all. And then we just, what? We just, help! We just glance at Jesus, right? And so today we're going to learn to reverse that. Uh, I mean... <laughs> You see people walking around. What's everybody doing when they're walking around now? They're what? They're looking down at their phone, right? Oh, today we're going to take our eyes. And you know what we're going to do? 
We're going to lift them up. And we're going to gaze at Jesus together. <laughs> and it's going to be so good. If you're new, welcome. Uh, we're walking through a book in the Bible called Colossians. We've had a break for a couple of weeks. The reason we're going through Colossians is it's the most Jesus-filled book in the Bible. It's all about the, the supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus. We've learned that Jesus is our creator and our savior, that he's the head of the church and he's the head of creation, that, uh, that he's before all things and in him all things hold together. We've seen that in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And now we're to Colossians chapter 3. So if you have your Bible, turn there with me. And if you don't bring a Bible, it's, it's really a good book and it's all about Jesus. Colossians 3 verse 1, therefore. Uh, now, I've taught you that when you see therefore, you ask the question, what? What is this therefore, there for? And I want you to know this is like the continental divide in the United States. It's, it's a huge change. Paul's letters, Paul's letters, like the first two chapters of this letter, like most of his letters, is all gospel. All to this point is all that Jesus has done for, done for us. And now it changes. Now it moves to gospel transformation. Here's how the gospel is meant to change our lives. If you're an English major, the first two chapters were all indicatives. It was all statements of fact. And now it moves from indicatives to imperatives. There's going to be just a machine gun of commands that are given, all made possible because of all that Jesus has done for us in the first two chapters. <clears throat> Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Now, this book, this, this passage is all about gazing at Jesus. Did, did you notice we saw Christ twice here? Well, let me show you. Five times in this passage we're going to see Christ. See, he raises up with Christ, and then where Christ is seated, and, and then it, your life is hidden with Christ and God, when Christ, with him. These verses are taking our eyes, getting them off of our circumstances, and lifting them up, lifting them up, and, and gazing at Jesus, gazing at Jesus. And some of you might say, well, smiley, I mean, does the Bible really call us to gaze at Jesus? Look at this verse in Proverbs. In Proverbs, let your eyes look directly ahead, and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. I mean... You're watching a basketball game, right? And the guy's shooting free throws. And everyone's trying to distract him, right? And oh, they concentrate on the basket. And, and that's what this verse says. In a world that's always trying to distract us, let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. If you want to follow Jesus, gaze at him because we steer toward where we stare. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, when we take our eyes off of our circumstances and we gaze at Jesus, we realize he has raised us from the dead. Did you hear that? Therefore, if, if you're a Christian, you have been raised up with Christ. He has raised you from the dead. If you're a Christian, Jesus loves you so much. He sent someone to share the gospel with you. But not only did he send someone to share the gospel, but he sent the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit to raise you from the dead, to open your eyes. Because our biggest struggle is to believe, is to believe both the bad news, how bad it is, and the good news, how good it is. So Jesus sends someone in the Holy Spirit. And what is the gospel? Remember when we were reading in chapter 2, in chapter 2 of Colossians, verse 13, when you were dead, in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, the bad news of the gospel is we have a problem called sin, that we, because of our sin, were spiritually dead. We were dead guilty because we had transgressed God's laws. We were dead, guilty, condemned. What we deserved is hell and helpless. 
Oh, the bad news. Dead, guilty, condemned, helpless. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him. He raised us from the dead. How did he do that? Having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, God the Son put on flesh and came to earth. And then he lived a perfect life, and he went to the cross, and all of our sins were placed on him. And he experienced the wrath of God in our place, dying in our place once for all, crying out, it is finished. He died for our sins and then he was buried. And then notice what we celebrated last week. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. On the third day, Jesus rose from the dead, proving he had conquered sin and death and the devil. And he walked out and he offers us the greatest gift ever, the gift of eternal life. Do you know, I did a funeral yesterday, and you know what matters most when someone has died is whether they knew Jesus or not, and you know, he did, and because of that, he's going to live forever. Do you? You see, Jesus rose from the grave, and he offers us eternal life, forgiveness for our sins, and the chance to do life and eternity with Jesus, and, and what does he ask of us? That we believe in him, right? I mean, John three sixteen for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to live and die and rise for us, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. How can we find forgiveness? How can we do life and eternity with, with Jesus? We believe in him, and believing in him is as simple as it's A and B and C. If you've never believed, if you've never received him, won't you? It starts when we admit, Jesus, I've sinned against you. I'm guilty. I'm helpless. We admit, and then we believe. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and rose. And then we commit. We trust Jesus as Savior. Jesus, I want you to forgive me and give me eternal life. And we trust him as Lord. Jesus, I surrender. I want you to move in and be Lord and help me be the person you want me to be. Won't you do that? <laughs> you can do that right now. Won't you admit and believe and commit? Or, or if you need help, I'll be glad to help you as we close in prayer. And if you have... If you have, I want you to understand what that means. You have eternal life. You have been forgiven. And listen, now you get to do life with Jesus, and he's given you the Holy Spirit so that you can do life with him and that you can do eternity with him. Matter of fact, let me, let me show you a verse in Galatians. This verse is so good. Notice in Galatians 5, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. I talk to many people, they say, well, it's easy to believe in Jesus. It's, it's hard to follow Jesus. And say, no, that's backwards. No, no. What this verse says, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit has raised you from the dead. If his power is sufficient to raise us from the dead, then his power is more than sufficient. <laughs> Let's walk by the Spirit. He's raised us from the dead. The hard parts are done. Now to walk by the Spirit is the one who raised us from the dead. He enables us to follow Jesus and to overcome our sin and to love our spouse and to honor our parents and to share our faith and to make disciples. <laughs> when we look at Jesus, we're reminded he raised us from the dead. And the Holy Spirit that he's given to us to raise us from the dead now lives in us so that we can follow him. Oh, listen. If we live by the Spirit, let's walk by the Spirit. Back to Colossians. This passage is, is so good. Um, if you've been raised up with Christ, listen, gaze at Jesus. He's raised us from the dead. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Gaze at Jesus. Gaze at Jesus. Seated at the right hand of God. When we look up, we see Jesus and he's seated at the Father's right hand. And you know what he's doing? You know what he's doing? He's praying for you and me. Is that cool? When we look up, when we get our eyes off of our circumstances and we look up, he's talking to the Father about us. Isn't that amazing? I mean, Jesus, right? He, 
He was God the Son, and he, and he put on flesh and came to earth. We celebrate that at Christmas, the incarnation. And then he died, and then he was buried. The third day he rose from the grave, right? And then he appeared to his disciples. He appeared to his disciples over a period of 40 days, didn't he? And then, and then he ascended into heaven, and, and he was seated at the right hand of, of God the Father. Um, don't we see that in Acts chapter 2? Uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, this Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, so Jesus is seated, sitting at the Father's right hand, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth that which you both see and hear. So Jesus ascended into heaven, and one week later, he poured out the Holy Spirit, and the church was birthed. How often, <clears throat> how often people have said, well, you know, Smiley, if I could have just lived when Jesus lived, if I could have just seen a miracle, if I could have just seen Jesus, but do you know what Jesus said? You do know, right? He said it's better. Jesus said it's better to have the Spirit inside us than Jesus beside us. Jesus said we live in the greatest time ever for Christians. He said it's better to have the Spirit inside us than Jesus beside us. Not convinced? How about in John, um, John chapter 16, Jesus says, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage. Jesus said it's better to have the Spirit inside us than Jesus beside us. Listen, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus ascends into heaven, and he pours out the Holy Spirit to live in us so that we can follow Christ, right? So that we can share our faith, so that we can be disciple makers, so we can overcome sin. So Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. He poured out the Holy Spirit and now listen to this. This is so, so good, okay? In Romans chapter 8, verse 31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who's against us? You ever feel like maybe our culture is against us? You, you feel overwhelmed? But the Bible says if God's for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son but deliver him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? He's given us his son. Can't we trust him for daily needs? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? <laughs> Isn't it great to know that God has justified us? And who, who could ever condemn us? Now listen to this. Um, God is the one who justifies. Who's the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. <laughs> so Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Here's how I imagine it is. Um, Jesus says, Smiley's a turkey, but he's mine. Oh, when I mess up, oh, he's a mess but he's mine. Isn't it great to know that we have at the Father's right hand Jesus who's saying, he's mine, she's mine, she's mine, he's mine. Did, did you know that when we gaze at Jesus, we, we see him praying to the Father on our behalf? And I want you to know that we have a dream team we have a dream team praying for us. You ever get discouraged? The reason we want to get our eyes off of our circumstances is look up is we have a dream team praying for us because in Romans 8, we read about how Jesus prays for us. In the same chapter, someone else is continually interceding for us. Do you know who it is? It's the Holy Spirit. Um, we read in the same chapter in verse 26, in the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should. <laughs> you ever face situations you say, I have no idea how to pray. Uh, but the Spirit himself intercedes us with groanings too deep for words. So the Holy Spirit is continually interceding for us. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. He's always interceding for us according to God's will. When we gaze up, we see Jesus 
seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, and the Holy Spirit interceding for us. That's why we want to gaze at Jesus and, and glance at our circumstances. Uh, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above. Uh, let me ask you, do you th spend more time thinking about the things above or the things on earth? Hmm? Gaze at Jesus, right? Glance at our circumstances. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died. Listen, the, the old person, the, who you were, that person has died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Listen, Jesus, we have given him our lives. We've given him our eternities, and he's able to get us safely home. Listen. Jesus is able to get us safely home. See what it says that our life is hidden with Christ and God? It means that we give him our eternity and it's in safekeeping. Like when Karen and I travel, when my wife and I travel, uh, I give her all the important things like the airplane tickets and, and the passports and all. You know why? Because it's safe there. If I'm taking it, I'm losing it. You know what it means to be a Christian? We've given our eternity to Jesus because he is able to get us safely home. Well, let me show you that. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, um, Paul's last letter. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Whenever Paul would share the gospel, he found hunger or hostility. There was a revival or there was a riot. And, uh, and, and Paul says, listen, join with me in suffering for the gospel. There has never been a time where people needed the gospel more than today. Never has there been more hunger in our culture than today. And also hostility. Paul says, will you join me in suffering for the gospel? Who has saved us? and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. <laughs> you ever feel like a nobody? Man, I sure do. And do you know that Jesus knew us before the world was even created? Isn't that amazing? Uh, his purpose granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Listen, Jesus died and rose so that we could live forever. I mean, do you know how good it is to be at a funeral like yesterday and be able to say that a dead man got up and walked out of the tomb and said we could too? Do you know anybody in our culture who's afraid of death and would like to know they could live forever? for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. Paul says, Jesus chose me to be a preacher and apostle. Do you know we're all appointed to be ambassadors? <laughs> Isn't that cool? We're ambassadors for Christ. We're witnesses of his. He appointed us. Here's what I wanted you to see. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Maybe you've put your precious things in a safe for safekeeping or a safety deposit box. You want it to be safe. Oh, when we entrust our souls and our eternity to Jesus, he is able to guard what we've entrusted to him until that day. He is able to get us safely home. Oh, I talk to so many Christians and they're so undone. That's why we need to gaze at Jesus and glance at our circumstances. If we look up, we see that Jesus has raised us from the dead. We see he's at the Father's right hand interceding for us. He's praying for us. We see that, that listen, he's able to get us safely home. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> and then verse 4, it's so good. When Christ who is our life. When we look up and we gaze at Jesus, we realize he's not just the one who gives us life. He is our life. Is he yours? Oh, 
Certainly one of my favorite verses is John 14, 6. Don't, don't you love this verse? Look at it. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Oh, when we gaze at Jesus, he's the way. People today say just one way. Oh. Religion says you have to be good to go to heaven. Listen, I don't stand a chance, but Jesus came to seek and save sinners. There is, if you've ever messed up like me, there is a way. There is a way for sinners to live forever, and Jesus is the way. Aren't you glad he's the way? I mean, if you ask people, are you a Christian? Some people act insulted. Well, of course I am. Man, if you ask me, Smiley, are you a Christian? I just want to laugh and laugh. How in the world? Could someone as rotten as me live with Jesus forever? Isn't that amazing? He's the way. He's the way. When we gaze at Jesus, he's the way. He's also the truth. Man, I'm so thankful to be a Christian, to know truth. Listen, there's truth. And truth is knowable. And it's found in a person. And his name is Jesus. We live in a morally confused culture that's confused over sex, and I look at Jesus, and the Bible says that God created us in His image, male and female. He created them. There's, we're all made in God's image, male and female. We don't have to be confused. We live in a culture confused over marriage, but we look at Jesus, and He says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. I'm so thankful that when I gaze at Jesus, I see truth. I don't have to wake up every day and go online and, and find out what's true today. I can look at Jesus and I can know the truth. That's why we gaze at him. Oh, <laughs> oh but he's not just the way and the truth. He's the life. Oh. Recently, I've been, people say, you know, Smiley, how are you? How are you? I'm in love. And they go, really? Yes. I have a friend who loves me. He knows everything about me, and he loves me. Isn't that what we all long for as a friend like that? I have a friend like that. His name is Jesus. Do you know what I find in a lot of marriages? A lot of people expect their spouse to be Jesus. Your spouse is not Jesus, and you are not either. But when you have a friend like Jesus who loves you like you long to be loved, then you can enjoy the deeply flawed love of your spouse so much more because you're already loved like you want to be loved. Oh, I am so thankful to have a friend who knows everything about me and still loves me, don't you? And you know what else Jesus brings me? He also brings me a purpose in life big enough to get me out of bed every day excited about life. Oh, when we gaze at Jesus, when we gaze at Jesus, you know what we see? We see that, listen, he raised us from the dead. We see that he's praying for us, that he can get us safely home, that he's our life. Oh, and then listen, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Oh. Listen, when we gaze at Jesus, we realize we're on the winning team. We're on the winning team. Don't we hear continually in our culture, listen, you don't want to be on the wrong side of history. Have you heard that? You don't want to be on the wrong side of history. Listen, I've read the book. I know how history ends. <laughs> Jesus is coming back. And those who believe in him, we're on the winning team. The thing we really need to say is, I don't want to be on the wrong side of Jesus. I don't want to be on the wrong side of eternity. Oh, dear people, I've read the book, and here's how it ends. In Revelation uh, 1, verse 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Jesus is coming back. Aren't you glad? And, and listen, only a few people saw when he came the first time because his glory was veiled. When he comes back, his glory will be unveiled. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. Listen, when Jesus comes back, every eye will see him. And those who believed in him will rejoice and be a part of the celebration of the ages. And those who die in their sins will be condemned and experience everlasting punishment. That's why it's so important we believe in Jesus and that we're on the winning team. 
So what we've learned so far, what we've learned is how important it is that we, we gaze at Jesus and glance at our circumstances, that, he's, that he raises from the dead, that he's praying for us, he can get us safely home, he's our life and we're on the winning team. And you say, well, what would that look like? What would it look like to, to gaze at Jesus? Well, I want to share with you about one of my heroes. His name is Stephen. Did you know that Stephen is the first Christian martyr? Uh, now, I have many heroes, but one Savior. Heroes inspire us. Jesus saves us. But Stephen <clears throat> was a deacon, and uh, he was an evangelist. He's sharing the gospel. He's performing miracles in the early church, and, and uh, the religious leaders get mad at him, and they arrest him, and they make all kind of false accusations about him. And in Acts chapter 7, Stephen gives this marvelous sermon where he says everything in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus, pointed to Jesus. And then um, what happens when people gaze at Jesus? Stephen speaking, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They kill those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You have received the, you have received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. You know what happens when people gaze at Jesus? They're bold. They're bold and courageous. Do you know what our country needs? Christians whose eyes are on Jesus and are bold and courageous who say to one another, they don't say be safe. We say gaze at Jesus and be bold and courageous. Don't we need truth speakers? Did you hear how Stephen spoke? I mean, if he had looked at his circumstances, he would have seen an angry crowd, right? And they had stones. And they were intent on doing great bodily harm to him, but his eyes were on Jesus and he had amazing boldness. Now, when they heard this, uh, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing in their teeth at him, but being full of the Holy Spirit. When people gaze at Jesus, they're full of the Holy Spirit. That's why they're bold. Notice, he gazed intently into heaven. His eyes were not on the crowd that wanted to kill him. His gaze was on Jesus. He gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He said, listen, you guys can kill me, and that's going to hurt for like three minutes. And then I'm going to be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. <clears throat> but they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Wow, one of those who saw him was Saul. And I don't think he ever forgot that, do you? They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Oh, when people gaze at Jesus, they're bold. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They're truth speakers. And uh, they become like Jesus. They live well and they die well. Isn't that exactly how Jesus died, isn't it? When Jesus was on the cross, the last thing he said was what? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Isn't it interesting that when Stephen looked at Jesus, he followed him in life and in death? Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Who does that remind you of? Jesus, isn't that exactly what Jesus said? Those who gathered around him, didn't he say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they did. When people gaze at Jesus, they follow Jesus and they speak like Jesus and act like Jesus. Having said this, he, he fell asleep. Oh, when people gaze at Jesus, boy, they're, they're bold and they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they live like Jesus and they die like Jesus, right? So, I bet you can't guess what our action step is going to be this week, huh? I want you to gaze at Jesus, to gaze at Jesus. Listen, do you want to follow Jesus? Then, then lift your eyes up off your phone and off the circumstances and gaze at Jesus. And if you gaze at Jesus, the Holy Spirit will, will lead you toward him. Isn't that the life you want to live? Isn't he beautiful? Don't you want to become like him? 
Listen, are there sins in your life that you want to overcome? Gaze at Jesus. For every time you, for every one time you look at your sin, look at Jesus 10 times. Gaze at Jesus 10 times and the Holy Spirit will say, listen, isn't that the life you want to live? Don't you want to follow Jesus? Jesus is better than your sin. Oh, do you want to experience peace in a crazy world? Gaze at Jesus. Do you want power to share your faith? Do you want to be a disciple maker? Gaze at Jesus. Gaze at Jesus. And, and you say, well, how, how, how do we do that? Well, one way is we spend time with him, right? Isn't that why we've gathered today? Haven't we gathered together today to gaze at Jesus together? Hasn't it been good? Hasn't it been good to take our eyes off of our circumstances and, and for 30 minutes or 40 minutes so we've gazed at Jesus, okay? Oh. Uh, listen, and isn't that why we gather in small group to take our eyes off of our circumstances and gaze at Jesus? And isn't that why we get up in the morning and have breakfast with Jesus? We want to start our day gazing at Jesus, right? When we spend time with Jesus, we're gazing at Jesus. Another way we gaze at Jesus is by sharing him with others, by sharing him with others. One of the things we're trying to equip you in the study every month is we want you to read the Word. Because when you read the Word, you gaze at Jesus. And then we're trying to teach you to pray the word. Because when you pray what you've read, you gaze at Jesus. And then we're trying to encourage you to share what you learned. Because when you talk about Jesus, you're gazing at him. Every day when I get together, what have you learned? In the evening when Karen, her mom, and I, when we have dinner, what did you see in your time with Jesus? When we talk about him, we gaze at him. So let me ask you a question. Or, or there, there, another skill with that is the same as with worship. When we gather to worship, we listen to his word, right? And we gaze at Jesus. On the way home, don't we pray his word? Lord, this week, help me to gaze at Jesus. And then we share his word. When you go and share with someone else what you heard, then you're gazing at Jesus. And let me ask you, do you know anyone in your life who's, who's like filled with fear over what's happening in the world? Don't they want to hear what you heard? Hey, could I, could I share with you what we learned in church today? What we learned in church today was to take our eyes and get them off of our circumstances and gaze at Jesus, to gaze at Jesus and learn just to glance at our circumstances. You can do it. When you share with others what you've heard, you're gazing at Jesus. This week, this week when people share with you how they failed, a hurt, a fear, oh, so many conversations I had with people this past week that were so perfect to be able to say, could I share with you what I've found helpful? What I've found helpful is learning to gaze at Jesus. Well, how can Jesus help? You can tell him, right? You've heard it a thousand times. You can share with people the bad news. You've heard it. You can share with people the good news. You've heard it a thousand times. You can share with people about ABC. You've heard it a thousand times. You really, really can. And you know what you'll find? If you gaze at Jesus, you'll be amazed at how many opportunities you have to share him with others. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so thankful that you came to seek and save sinners. Thank you for dying and rising and offering us eternal life. Listen, if you've never received that gift, won't you? I mean, Jesus is here. Won't you say, Jesus, I've sinned against you. I'm sorry. And I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and rose. And I want you to come into my life and be my Savior and forgive me and, and give me eternal life. I want you to be Lord of my life and help me be the person you want me to be. Oh, if you've done that for the first time, way to go. Won't you mark that on your card? We'd love to celebrate with you and tell someone it'll make Jesus more real to you. And Jesus, I want to thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to raise us from the dead uh, so that we would believe in you. And Lord, I pray this week that, that we would gaze at you and see that you've raised us from the dead and we'd say thank you. That we would see you and you, Holy Spirit, interceding for us and we would say thank you. Jesus, that we would see you and realize that you will get us safely home. That we would see you and realize you are our life. 
And Jesus, we would see you and realize that we're on the winning team. Lord, I pray as we go out this week that we would all have opportunities to share with others what we've learned today. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.